Let's all read together. Now when, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before, and those who followed, were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! Mark 11, 1 through 11.
last time I had to speak in front of a camera, I was in seminary in a preaching class where you had to speak in front of a camera or speak in front of your classmates, which is pretty embarrassing, or into a mirror. But this is a lot better because as I preach this morning, I'm visualizing you, my great fellowship brothers and sisters, because I really miss worshiping with you, especially singing God's praises together. And I'm never going to take that for granted again. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have brought us together, even electronically, to be able to look into your word, to be able to gain a deeper appreciation for who Jesus is and how he can bring joy in sorrowful situations, in sad situations, in frightening situations. I thank you, Father, that we can be joined by your spirit, even though we may be not physically present with each other. So help us this morning, Father, to learn what we can, to glean what we can from your word and apply it to our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we commemorate the beginning of Jesus' last week on earth, what we call Holy Week. The week begins with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as the Messiah and King, and ends with his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. And the event we celebrate today is called Palm Sunday, or the Triumphal Entry. At this point in his life, Jesus had left his home area in Capernaum and was on his way to Jerusalem for the final events of his earthly life. He passed through Jericho, where one or two blind men had desperately wanted to be able to see and to see Jesus. And Jesus restored their sight. And last week, you had the chance to look at the wee little man Zacchaeus, who was too short to see Jesus, but desperately wanted to see him too. He risked even more ridicule than usual by climbing a tree alongside the main highway through Jericho. He wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus opened his spiritual eyes. Zacchaeus' heart was made alive, and he made restitution for his thievery as a tax collector. Now, all of these men wanted to see Jesus, and their desire was rewarded. This is in direct contrast with the rest of the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the events that followed. Blindness characterizes Palm Sunday and Holy Week, even in Jesus' own disciples. Now, Jesus had made no secret that even over their objections, he must go to Jerusalem. Matthew 20 records it this way. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he'll be raised on the third day. Well, Jesus continues his ministry from this point forward, teaching that he must be rejected, he has to suffer, he must be crucified, but he will rise again from the dead. That's God's plan for his Messiah. But it was definitely not the understanding of anyone else. Messiah to everyone except Jesus meant that as a son of David, who would be anointed by God and who would come to Israel to bring a political deliverance from the yoke of the heathen, the Romans, and to establish his kingdom on earth. Well, because of the widespread misunderstanding of the identity of the Messiah in Jewish culture, up to this point Jesus did not disclose his full identity because the people then would not have listened to his teachings about the true nature of the kingdom. Had Jesus publicly proclaimed himself to be the Messiah, that proclamation would have been received by the people as a rallying cry to, cry to rebellion against Rome. So he kept it as quiet as he could in each of the Gospels until now. From now on, Jesus is openly declaring that he is the king. No more secrecy. The velvet has come off the globe. He knows that the end of his earthly ministry is short, and he desires that the people finally recognize him as king knowing full well that they're going to reject his rule over them because he doesn't fit their mold. They're blind. The king of kings wants the hearts of people to be exposed. They would rather kill the king than submit to his rule on his terms. Now Jesus knew full well he would be dead within a week of Palm Sunday. And not only would he die, but he experienced excruciating pain in the process. He also knew that he'd be raised from the dead never more to die. So if Jesus experienced pain, fear, and sorrow, 
knowing that he would die a cruel death in a matter of days, what hope do we have in the face of a highly contagious killer virus that keeps us hunkered down at home? We're fearful of contracting the virus ourselves, or, or even worse than that, inflicting someone else with it without even knowing it. If I were to ask you, how would you act if you knew that you had one week to live? How would you react? I think that'd be easier to deal with in some ways than what we're now facing. A definite diagnosis that death is a real possibility is something we can prepare for. It's a fear, but it's a rational fear. When I got up the morning of May 16th, 2019, I felt really good. By the afternoon, I was told I had prostate cancer. The specter of death was present, but even if treatment had not been available, there was time to take care of any open issues. And that becomes a rational fear of death. When the possibility of serious illness or death confronts us, but it hasn't affected us personally, it's much easier to become fearful and even panic. When no or only confusing answers are all we have, our imaginations go into passing gear. Fear becomes irrational. Irrational fear and anxiety is a hysterical reaction to a threat that hasn't affected us personally, while rational fear is a calculated response to a real danger, like a cancer diagnosis. Irrational fear freezes us in panic mode, immobilizing our senses, while rational fear summons us to anticipate future events as well as to evade real and present perils. Irrational fear is an out-of-control thought pattern. It settles over the mind like a severe weather system, spewing tornadoes and, and casting lightning bolts. Life feels like an airplane in a tailspin. It feeds on what ifs, it feeds on what worst case scenarios. And media frenzy amplifies the feelings. I mean, what if coronavirus is unstoppable? What if a pandemic takes over and we become the center of it? I'll be quarantined for weeks. The economy is sliding into a, into a bear market or worse. I could lose my health. I'll lose my job, maybe I've already lost it. How will I and my family survive? Well, in many ways, fear and anxiety like this is just like the virus itself. A virus is a very strange organism. It contains the raw material, the RNA, required for life, but it can't replicate itself. In order to reproduce, it has to fasten itself to a cell that will accept it. Then it can enter the living cell and hijack its reproductive factory to make more viruses instead of more healthy cells. And once there are enough virus cells, the host cell sends the viruses out to attach themselves to other host cells, and the process begins a geometric progression of infection. And that's just how irrational fear, the hysterical reaction to a threat that hasn't affected us personally, operates. Irrational fear looks for a receptive host. It can only take root and grow if it can gain a foothold in your heart, in your innermost being, and spread to your emotions and your will. The greater the foothold, the stronger the attack. Well, how can we reduce the size of the foothold? How can we make our hearts resistant to irrational fear? We're being told everywhere, it seems, that anxiety about the coronavirus is a psychological issue that can be dealt with by therapy, either from yourself or from the outside expert. Now, efforts like that can help us with coping, but the root of anxiety goes too deep to be cut off just using techniques that help make adjustments to our thoughts or our behavior. I mean, the internet, of course, contains many helpful things to deal with anxiety, everything from Eastern meditation to yoga to herbal remedies, to alcohol immersion are suggested for us. But how do we cut off the root rather than just pruning the visible growth of fear and anxiety? What is the root? Well, early in Jesus' ministry, he let us know in his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you being anxious can add but a single hour to his span of life? Why are you so anxious about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is sown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Well, Jesus is teaching here, early in his ministry, that the root of anxiety, its foothold in our heart, is an inadequate trust in our Father's loving care for us. As unbelief, as failure to trust, as being of little faith, gets the upper hand in our hearts, one of the effects is anxiety. The root cause of anxiety is a failure to trust all that God has promised to be for us in Jesus as a loyal subject of his kingdom. Now, in one way, this is not very good news, because unbelief is a very serious cancer. But in another sense, it is good news, because knowing what is really wrong is good, especially since unbelief is something that our great physician is really good at curing. He's able to work in wonderfully healing ways when we cry out, I do believe, but help my unbelief. So as we enter Holy Week, Jesus is near the end of his public ministry on earth. He's on his way to suffer and die, but also to be raised from the dead and ascend back to the Father. At the same time, he's also a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief and fear and anxiety. As Jesus went down the Mount of Olives with the crowd shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! God save! All around him, he was overcome with compassion over Jerusalem and its inhabitants. He wailed, he lamented, he cried deeply over the blindness of the people who would not recognize their true king. He was able to see their destruction that would occur about 40 years in the future when the Roman army would come in and destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Also, he was not only just sorrowful over the fate of others, later on in the week, of the Holy Week, when he spent time in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was in anguish, in deep anguish, when he had to battle the temptation to opt out of the crucifixion. He experienced sorrow and real fear at a deeply personal level. So Jesus experienced anxiety. He experienced fear at a level we cannot fully comprehend. He experienced sorrow over the lives that would be lost in Jerusalem. He was truly a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. His final earthly journey was sad and painful and emotionally devastating. Then how do we explain God's commentary on Jesus' experience in the book of Hebrews? In Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 12 begins with this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured, such, endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. What kind of divine alchemy is this? Jesus actually suffered during the last week of his life on earth, yet Hebrews 12 declares that joy was set before him that enabled him to endure the cross and gain ultimate victory over death. How does that work? I mean, if we could figure out how sorrow and joy can coexist, there'd be no foothold for fear and anxiety in our hearts. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In other words, life is more like a marathon than a 100-yard dash. It's long. There are hills along the way that make your muscles burn, muscles burn to the point where they're screaming at you, you can't finish this. And all these witnesses that we saw in chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews are saying, yes, you can finish. We did. 
There may be hills and sleet and wind in your face, but you can finish the race in faith and love. And verse 1 there tells us that we don't run this marathon with an overcoat on your shoulders, and you don't run this marathon with performance-enhancing drugs in your veins. Right in the middle of verse 1 it says, Let us lay aside every weight, every sin. We're not stupid, and we don't cheat. It's stupid to wear an overcoat in a race, and it's cheating to use drugs. We lay aside weights, and we lay aside sins. So the main point in chapter 12 is one command. Run. Everything else supports this. It explains it or it gives motivation. Run the race that's set before you. Everything else supports this. Don't stroll. Don't meander. Don't wander about aimlessly. Run as in a race with a finish line and with everything hanging on it. And verse 2 now gives us perhaps the deepest answer to that question of how to sorrow and joy work together. You're going to face the hills, the cold, and the wind, and the thoughts of hopelessness about finishing. You're going to face them like this, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So you must look to Jesus as you run. And what you're going to focus on as you look to him is this. He ran first. His race was 33 years long, and it ended with a horrific gauntlet of opposition and suffering, namely the unspeakable torture of the cross and the immeasurable shame of such a death. He ran it, and he finished it. Well, how? Look at these words in the middle of verse 2. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. I'm sure you'll agree that the marathon that Jesus ran was a marathon of love, love of others. The last several hundred yards of that marathon, with, he ran with nails in his hands and feet, a spear at his side, and a crown of thorns on his head. And that was the greatest act of love that's ever been performed in the history of the world. Because he was dying for our sins, not his own. So my question for my life and your life, how can I run like this? If I can run like that, irrational anxiety about the unknown and fear of disease will be transformed into joy. And the central answer of this verse is, the greatest act of love that was ever performed was performed for the joy that was set before him. Jesus was sustained through the cross and through the shame by the joy that he anticipated at the end of his marathon. Now the book of Hebrews defines faith at the beginning of chapter 11. Like this, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Things hoped for refers to the future, when we reach the end of our marathon. Assurance of this future hope is the joy of spending eternity in the very presence of God. Our hope is a certainty to be with God forever. But it's not just future. The key element here is that the everlasting joy in God that we're hoping for at the very end of our marathon can become our experience right now through faith. In the midst of our cross, in the midst of our shame. That's the essence of grace. Grace is the power of the future being brought into the present. The power of the future being brought into the present. It's a power. And that's what Jesus means for us as citizens of his kingdom. The power of the king is given to us now in a preliminary way, as a taste of what is to come in its fullness in the future. Since there will be no evil in God's final kingdom, that is how it has the power to overcome fear and anxiety in the present. So let's ask this question. If this joy is set before us, this spring overflowing from the future back into the present, is so powerful in transforming fear and anxiety, if this is the way that we should be sustained in our acts of love as Jesus was, how do we tap into that flow? Well, if this world is your treasure, rather than the immeasurable pleasures of being with Christ forever, you'll be able to love in a way that makes Christ look great. You'll be beset by irrational fear and anxiety. But if Christ is the all-satisfying joy set before you, 
you'll magnify his glory in all the things that you do, especially in your interaction with other individuals around you. The Apostle Paul has a helpful hint here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 8-10. through 10. He says, We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet as known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. But what does it mean that part of Paul's commendation to the world is that he was sorrowful, yet always rejoicing? I think it means that what the church, the world needs from the church is our unquestioning joy, unconquerable joy in Jesus in the midst of suffering and sorrow. Joy in the midst of health? Joy in the midst of wealth and ease? Why would that mean anything to the world around us? They have that already. But joy in the midst of sorrow? That they don't have. And that's what Jesus came to give us in this fallen and pain-filled world. Paul says, you see us as sorrowful, yet we're always rejoicing. Yes, we are sorrowful. There are countless reasons for our hearts to break. But in them all, we do not cease to rejoice. One of the greatest paradoxes in the Christian life. He further says, you see us as poor, yet we are making many rich. Yes, we are poor in this world's wealth, but we don't live to get rich on things. We live to make people rich on Jesus. What the world needs from Grace Fellowship is our all-consuming joy in Jesus in the midst of the suffering and sorrow around us. I mean, isn't that what the world really needs from us? Not just an invitation to joy, not just a painful expression of concern, but the pain and the joy coming together in such a way that they've never seen anything like it. They've never been loved like this. They've never seen joy in Jesus in the midst of sorrow. And by God's grace, it may taste like the salt of the earth and look like the light of the world to those that are hurting around us. Well, this was Paul's commendation of his ministry. May it be our commendation of Christ at Grace Fellowship. It's no accident that Paul concluded one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, Romans chapter 8, with words that are designed pointedly to sustain your joy and my joy in the face of suffering and loss and disease lurking about. In Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who should bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or coronavirus, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It doesn't really matter if we're being killed by coronavirus or anti-Christian mobs. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And all these things, he says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Therefore, Christian, lover of God, called out of darkness into his glorious light, lift up your head, put a song in your mouth, love your neighbor, and don't be afraid of any consequences. And my concluding plea is this. Use your unexpected time at home to extend your roots deeply into the love of God. Spend time with God through his word. Get to know Jesus Christ in a way you never have before. Go deep with Jesus until he becomes the supreme treasure of your life, until he becomes that all-satisfying joy set before you. So brothers and sisters, socially distance yourself 
but don't socially isolate yourselves. Let the world taste and see how to experience never-ending joy in the midst of suffering and sorrow. Father, I thank you that you have given us a big task to fulfill. When people around us are panicked, when people around us may be uncertain what the future may hold, you have given us words of life. You have given us the ability to be light and salt. So, Father, help us to find creative ways to do that amongst ourselves, but also with our neighbors, individuals who may not understand that it is possible to actually experience joy in the midst of suffering. Just thank you, Father, for doing these things and for watching over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul in the book of 2 Thessalonians. 
Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all.